I'll come back to you. <laughs> Good morning. Even though I'm not your regular pastor, I'll say welcome. Welcome to worship at Christ Lutheran Church, Hendricks. When I walked in up there and walked into the chancel, I had the feeling I'd been here before. Anybody ever remember my being here? Must be a dream <laughs> that I had. But that is so familiar, that layout up there. So I don't know, maybe. Yeah, 72? <laughs> 72. Well, we were living in Brookings then. Could be. <laughs> anyway, I'm Pastor Jim Tvet. I've been around for a while, here and there and elsewhere. I haven't done this for 15 months. I was filling in at uh, Lake Campbell and Sinai Lutheran Church when uh, their new pastor arrived and COVID hit and the pandemic. And uh, we've been practically in our home all the time until about a couple months ago. And we'd go out to the clinic, walk a block to get the mail and uh, go to the garden. And uh, that was about it. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm married to this woman here, my wife Gloria, who grew up in Minnesota in a little town called Beltrami, uh, up on Highway 75, north of Moorhead, south of Crookston. And uh, we met at Concordia College, uh, where I graduated and married her, and then she had to go back to school to finish. She has her master's from uh, SDSU in Brookings in uh, teacher education. <coughs> I, uh, my first call was to start a congregation from scratch in Newcastle, Wyoming. Twelve people, families, had asked for a congregation to be started in the old ELC. Said, okay, we'll start one and we'll send a seminary graduate out there. And uh, that ended up being me. <clears throat> from there, it was Sisseton, South Dakota, for 16 and a half years. And uh, then it was Brookings, First Lutheran Church in Brookings for 12 and a half years. Then it was uh, three years in Seoul, South Korea, and come back and did an interim at, of all places, Lagonger in Woodlake. Uh, and uh, then uh, went to Copenhagen, Denmark, for a half a year and came back and did an interim at Esteline, uh, went to Egypt, uh, came back and did an interim at Lagonger and Woodlake, and uh, I can't remember, there's one more at Esteline, and uh, we're members of Ascension in, in Brookings, and uh, <coughs> so we lived there and traveled here and there along the way. Uh, we have a uh, Oh, like I said, I haven't done this for about 15 months, and my steps are slower, and my eyes are weaker, <coughs> and uh, I've got a lens. In, I have cataract surgery in both eyes, and the lens in this eye is starting to get a little foggy. So if I had have to do this to see, you won't know why. <coughs> we'll do communion by uh, walkthrough communion today, so come up to center aisle, and I don't know who tells you when to get up and come. Uh, somebody will come and help and hold the, the wine, I'll hold the bread, and you just walk by us and take the, we'll do one side first and then shift sides for Holy Communion today. Are there other announcements that should be made? I'll be back next week, by the way, so. Uh, if the crowd is a lot smaller, then I'll know something. And if it's about the same, I'll know something. And if the place is full, I'll be surprised. <laughs> <coughs> be a good surprise. Well, we begin with the order for confession and forgiveness that starts on page 94 in the front of the hymnal. 
and I invite you to stand as you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing hymn number 879. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, 
sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. By your wisdom, instruct us. And by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Good morning, and happy Father's Day. The first lesson this morning comes from the book of Job. In the Old Testament, you'll find it on page 595, chapter 38, first 11 verses. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens the counsels by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut the sea with the doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. The psalm this morning is also in the Old Testament, page 687. Psalm 107, the first three verses, and then 23 to 32. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those who he redeemed from trouble. And gather in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works of the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven and they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to human mankind. Let him extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. The last reading this morning comes from the New Testament, 2 Corinthians. You find it on page 221. Chapter 6, the first 13 verses. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on the day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, 
beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors, and yet we are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, and see, we are alive, as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. This ends the reading. The word of the Lord. I'll explain this in a moment. It's kind of become the common practice in some places and by some pastors that they read the text from the pulpit and preach from the aisle. I'm convinced we should read the gospel from the midst of the people, right out here where we all are together, and use the pulpit for what it's meant for, a place for proclamation of the word. And so I'll read from here. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel, the holy gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, his disciples, let us go to the other, across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. Living and loving God, we thank you that as your Holy Spirit works within our lives through your word to us, we can know that in the midst of all of the changes, chances, Circumstances, threats, fears, longings of our lives, we can know that Jesus is with us. Help us at times to be at awe at the wonder of his presence, his power, his purpose. Help us to trust. Open up our hearts and our minds to whatever you have to say to us. And use our words now to do in us and through us anything you want from us 
for us and through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One brief caveat, if you happen to be one of those persons who listened to the Hour of Hope uh, way back, uh, you may, and if you got a really, really, really good memory, you'll recognize a, a few sentences of what I say here today, because I did spend 10 years as the voice of the Hour of Hope. Dear listening friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who is at work in us and through us and in the world. Amen. But Mark, from whose account of the works and words of Jesus we have just read. What Mark tells us about that, following Jesus being baptized in the River Jordan and the calling of disciples and struggling in the Satan, with Satan in the wilderness, it could almost sound what he describes starting there in what we have read now, a little before that, a little after that, it almost sounds like it could have been a relaxing summer at the seaside. Each of the first eight chapters of what Mark wrote, he tells us that Jesus was either walking on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, teaching along the shoreline, teaching from a boat just offshore, crossing back and forth between what was known as the Jewish side and the Gentile side and back again. The Sea of Galilee was kind of like Lake Hendricks. You have a South Dakota side of that lake and you have a Minnesota side of that lake. Uh, hopefully the Minnesotans and the South Dakotans got along a lot better than the Jews and Gentiles did. Uh, but there were the two sides and Jesus went to both sides, back and forth across this lake. In just four of these chapters, Jesus and his disciples get into a boat and cross that Sea of Galilee six times. Now it's very clear that this was not a relaxing lakeside outing. It takes a miracle to survive alive in those trips across that lake. The closest followers of Jesus that we now call the apostles had already seen and heard Jesus do and say many, many very remarkable things. They had been astonished at his teaching. Demons had been cast out of people possessed by evil. The sick had been healed. Lepers had been cleansed. Forgiveness had been pronounced. A withered hand had been healed and stretched out and made whole. They had been given power to do some of those same things themselves. Jesus sent them out to do some of those same things in the towns around and about the Sea of Galilee. Jesus did not do those powerful things in order to prove that he could do it. He did them to show them who he was and who he is. Jesus did compassionate things to teach about himself. Miracles are miracles, of course. They really did happen. Jesus really did do them. And they certainly brought rich blessings into the lives of those people who received the mercy, the grace, the power, the goodness of God through Jesus Christ. But they're more than just acts of power. In a sense, they're like acted out parables, teaching. 
When we think about that storm at that, on that sea and the reaction of the disciples and, and the action of Jesus instilling the storm, we can see not only power, but we can see the person and the purpose of Jesus. Jesus showed them that they could trust. They could trust him as Lord. Jesus did what only the living, creating, and loving God could do. There are dozens of places in the Old Testament that it's made clear that it is God who controls the wind. It is God who controls the seas and the waves. When God created all that exists, he put the seas into their appropriate places. Whenever the wind and the sea is seen as evil, it is God who restricts the winds, God who restricts the sea, who controls the sea. And whenever the wind and waves are seen as a blessing, it is God who is sending them. Promises are made and proclaimed in word, in pictures, acted out parables of wind and water. The wind will bring the Spirit of God. God breathes and the Spirit of God enters the people. Water brings refreshment in the wilderness. And so when Jesus stilled the wind and calmed the waves that were at the very point of destroying the boat and the disciples in it, they knew that Jesus was like no one else they had ever met. Their fear of the storm, which was certainly frightful, was replaced by a new kind of fear, an awe, a wonder. Who is this? Who is this who could do something like that? Calm the sea and still the wind. Jesus was not the, a good buddy to whom we can say, we just want to ask you, Jesus, to do this nice thing for us. No, Jesus is clearly Lord of all things. Well, this miracle of stilling the storms is like a parable of, about the power, the person, and the purpose of Jesus. It's also a parable about discipleship. Earlier, Jesus had said, follow me. And they did. Jesus had said, let us go across to the other side. And they set out to do that. When Mark wrote about it, his words were, as we read, and they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Sounds simple. Get in the boat. Push off from shore. Go safely and securely in the boat to the other side. Well, it didn't turn out quite that way. It turns out to be dangerous to be in the boat with Jesus. Out there on the lake that day, the immediate threat was a storm. A storm that suddenly erupted. The wind and the waves meant that that boat, even with Jesus in it, did not seem to be very safe anymore. And while the storm that day on the sea was a weather storm, they would face lots of other storms in the years to come. Storms in the lives of those closest followers of Jesus. The followers would be subjected to public ridicule, social rejection, some of them would be lynched, they would be arrested, they would be tried, they would be imprisoned, some would be executed. Life would not be like living on a houseboat moored at a dock, a dock on the side of a lake. It was going to take a crucifixion and a burial and a resurrection to convince them that having Jesus with them was all they would ever truly need. Well, this world 
can still be a pretty stormy place. Some of the storms are the kind that the weather brings, of course, destructive winds and rains and earthquakes and tornadoes, or weeks and weeks without significant rain and more, bringing physical and emotional devastation. Some of the storms are natural weather storms. Some are social and economic and political storms where, where the people of God are called on to struggle with all that's wrong, with all of the brokenness, brokenness in ourselves and in the world about us. Personal lives get caught in storms. Illness takes its toll on life and strength. Personal relationships like those of friendship and marriage and families can seem to go from one crisis to the next at times. Pandemics disrupt just about everything and lead us to wonder, what next? People will struggle with feelings about themselves and their worth and their future, their neighbors, their friends, their communities, wondering if anything's ever gonna get better. Sometimes even in our personal lives, it's, it's the weather that leaves us feeling beat up in life because it's too hot or too cold or too wet or too dry. Almost everyone, some of the time, and some persons almost all of the time, are beset by feelings of loneliness and despair. In 1933, I can remember that number since that's the year I was born, I didn't hear the song then, but there was a song written and made very popular by several singers. It was meant to be a song about a relationship between a man and a woman that needing each other and things didn't always go really like it should. And, uh, but if we change a few words, it can also be about what we often feel when we think about the living God. And that we wonder if God is really caring for us and about us. And there's a part about rain in there, and that doesn't really fit this year, here, in mid, upper Midwest United States. But if we replace the my man with my God, <coughs> the song might express what persons often feel. Some of you know this pretty well, but I'm not gonna sing it for you anyway. I'll just read a part of it. Don't know why there's no sun in the sky, stormy weather, since my God and I ain't together. Life is bare, gloom and misery everywhere, stormy weather, just can't get my poor self together. I'm weary all the time, all the time, can't go on, everything I had is gone. Stormy weather, since my God and I ain't together. And there are far-reaching global struggles as well that feel like devastating storms in the political systems of almost every nation in the world. There's really kind of a mess in the world all the time. Continual bloodshed in some countries, continual in invasions and attacks and genocides, and all kinds of destruction going on here and there and elsewhere in the world. Economic and nationalistic tensions seem to explode within countries. Powerful nations of the world are constantly kind of choosing up sides between which side are they gonna be on. Governments result in people living in fear, even in their own homes. We cannot, in this life, avoid being in the midst of storms. We might very well join the disciples in asking, Lord, don't you care? If we try to isolate ourselves and live our lives in some sort of safe harbor, our own conscience will create a storm within us in the center of our hearts and minds 
The only hope for peace for the disciples in that boat, the only hope for peace, the only hope for us as we seek to live with ourselves and those around us and in this world, the only hope is that Jesus is with us. When Jesus muzzled that storm that night on the sea, it did not bring an end to the turmoil. Those disciples would cross that sea in a boat again and again and again. Jesus would heal a deranged man who was chained and living in a cemetery on the Gentile side of that sea. They would come back across that sea and they would be met by an uh, ambassador in a sense of a man whose daughter was dying and he would bring life back to that dead daughter of a leader in that community. Another way to heal a woman with an almost lifelong illness, he healed another person. 5,000 people would be fed. Going back to the Gentile side, crowds of sick people would be waiting. Another young woman would need healing. Because of Jesus, no one need live in fear seeing ourselves as all alone in the world, all alone <clears throat> facing what comes to us in this life. We do not live without the presence, the person, the power of God at work in the world. We do not live in a world controlled by destructive powers and demonic purposes. Jesus is with us, even when it seems to us that he's asleep. Amen.
I invite you to stand as you are able and join your voices with the faithful in every place and every time in confessing our faith, speaking together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and for all creation. I will lead us in brief petitions of prayer, concluding each one with, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Holy God, you gather your people from east and west, north and south. We pray for the mission of the church throughout the world, that your steadfast love may be made known to all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. You laid the foundations of the earth, and the waters are the womb of creation. Morning stars sing your name. All creation shouts for joy. We pray for your blessed creation, that it may continue to flourish and magnify your glory. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> you keep watch over all nations. We pray for countries experiencing violence, hunger, unrest. Guide worldwide and local community organizations, governments everywhere in their efforts to establish safety and justice. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> you are close to the brokenhearted and near to those in distress. We pray for those who are experiencing oppression. Liberate us from the systems and chains that bind us. Remove the barriers that separate us from one another. Lord, in your mercy. You dwell with us in this faith community. We pray for our teachers and elders. Grant them knowledge and patience and kindness that through their leadership you may be exalted in this assembly. Lord, in your mercy. Your love endures in all situations. On this Father's Day, we pray for those who are fathers or wish to be fathers for those with broken or strained relationships, for those who are missing their fathers, and those fathers who have lost children. Bless and strengthen them. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O Lord, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and when he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Lord, remember us as you teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. And I'm not sure how you determine your pattern, but we'll do continuous communion. Uh, somebody's going to help, I guess. And we'll distribute the bread and the wine right down here at the head of the aisle. I'll do the bread if that's okay. Sure. Okay, and then I'll exchange them when they get empty. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna turn you off. I invite you to stand as you are able. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in his grace now and always. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing hymn number 625.
God. Go in peace and serve the Lord.